Thank you. Very glad to be here today, and I'm particularly glad to be the first of 11 speakers. That means I get to talk and then relax and listen to everybody else. Um, how many of you have been to a TEDx meeting before? I'm going to try to do something very courageous and experimental today. I'm going to give a TED talk without any pictures. I'm talking about Facebook diplomacy, which isn't all that photogenic. And so I'm going to focus on a few key ideas. I'm here at Georgetown because I decided in the middle of my career to take a bit of a sabbatical. I started working here in Washington in the Senate as Al Gore's science advisor. He got promoted. I went with him to the White House. And then I spent some time at the Federal Communications Commission and at IBM. And during that time, I was working on internet policy, working internationally to help foster the growth of the internet. And I learned a little bit about diplomacy, both at the White House and at IBM. But three years ago, I decided to come to, to Georgetown because I wanted to explore all the different impacts that the internet was having around the world. And I found at Georgetown a special program, Communications, Culture, and Technology, that brought together people from a whole range of disciplines, economics, computer science, political science, sociology, all trying to understand the impact of technology and the internet. And perhaps even more exciting, I found that there were pockets of people all over Georgetown, in the economics department, in the School of Foreign Service, of course in the computer science department, in the Berkeley Center on Religion, all of them trying to understand how the internet was impacting society. I've done a lot of work on the evolution of the internet, but today I'm going to focus on one piece of the puzzle, one particularly interesting application of technology. The reason I'm talking about Facebook diplomacy is because of a coincidence. Paula Newberg and I were going to do this talk together, but the schedules didn't allow that. The reason we were going to do it together was because two years ago, we showed up at the graduate school commencement and found that Nelson and Newberg are right next to each other in line. We got talking. She's the head of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy in the School of Foreign Service. Very interested in how nations talk to each other. I'm an internet geek. And the two of us decided we needed to work together to understand how these technologies were changing the way that nations talk to each other and the way diplomats work. Now, this is an interesting problem. <laughs> There's very little overlap between the geeks and the diplomats. Very little. But fortunately, some of the people who do care about both topics fall, are working here at Georgetown. And so Paul and I started um, a rapprochement, a little bit of, of discussion between these two camps. And it was different, because we had the techies who talk about bits and bytes. They don't read foreign affairs. They read Wired magazine. And we have this idea that maybe government can go away. At least some of us do. And we tend to work in internet time, and we're, we tend to be kind of sloppy and fast. You often produce a product in three to six months. Diplomats, on the other hand, work in treaty time. Just the opposite of internet time. Often takes 10 or 20 years to negotiate a treaty, but that's because every semicolon has to be negotiated, and has to be in the right place. But somehow, we brought these two communities together. We um, started focusing on one key question. How is the internet changing relationships between countries? And we formed a iDiplomacy luncheon group. It's met about five times so far. Geeks, diplomats, political scientists, a bunch of other people who were interested in this problem. And we started asking questions about how is the internet changing the way that nations project power? How is the internet enabling and empowering non-governmental actors? from Greenpeace to the Catholic Church? How is diplomacy being affected by WikiLeaks and similar, similar activities like OpenLeaks? And of course, for the last three months, we've been spending a lot of time talking about Egypt and Tunisia and the role of the internet there. So today, I'm going to talk about my big idea, which is that the internet is going to fundamentally change the way that citizens think about the nation state. Now, we've been talking about that for a while, and we've been wondering how long that's going to take. Um, people speculated 100 years ago that things would change, that nation states would go away. 
Karl Marx, Hedrick Engels, famous for saying that the state would wither away as communism replaced the need for governments. Uh, that was kind of wrong, since Marxism inspired the formation of the Soviet Union, obviously the most authoritative, authoritarian and powerful uh, uh, non-democracy we've ever seen. Uh, another prediction made back in 1997 was by John Perry Barlow. He, he fashions himself as the Thomas Paine of cyberspace, former uh, songwriter for the Grateful Dead. He was in Davos at the World Economic Forum in 1997, just as the internet was kind of blossoming, just as we were at the first stages of the excitement about um, e-commerce and the new freedom of speech that was giving people in countries around the world. And he wrote the Declaration of Independence for Cyberspace, very utopian, revolutionary document. Among the quotes that I like to quote are, we have no elected government, nor are we likely to have one. I declare the global social space we are building to be naturally independent of the tyrannies you seek to impose on us. This has been kind of the manifesto of the cyber libertarians and the cyber anarchists. Well, it turned out that that didn't really happen that way. And we don't really know how the power struggle between the internet-enabled citizens and protesters and the governments are, is going to work out. We see the battles now in the streets between the tweeters and the people with tanks. And so far, there have been a few successful revolutions and a few not so successful revolutions. There's been a fascinating debate over the last four months in the blogosphere between people who support the position of Yevgeny Morozov, who wrote a recent book called The Net Delusion. He actually wrote that book while here at Georgetown. He spent a year as a Yahoo fellow studying this question. He's on one side of the debate. His argument is the internet will actually be used by governments to contain and control their citizens, to control what information they get. On the other side is Clay Shirky and a number of us who believe that in the long term, this technology, particularly social media, are going to enable citizens to rise up, express their views, and empower them to take civil action and push governments in the direction they want. But again, it's too early to know just which of these two camps will turn out to be right. I have another prediction, though, one that I made in 1998 in an article for the Aspen Institute. I wrote an article called Sovereignty in the Networked World. And I made a checklist of all the things that nations like to control. Media, what their citizens think, where their citizens work, the currency, value of their currency, where money flows. All these things that governments define as part of sovereignty. And then I explained why by 2010, now, that was going to be less likely. But one of the more interesting predictions I made and one of the more controversial was that we would move away from having national identities. That this technology over time, and it would take 20 or 30 years, would lead to more and more people who thought of themselves as a-national. And we see some classes of people like that already. Some of the high-flying consultants who spend six months in every country, who really think of themselves as citizens of the world. There's also a class of global teenagers who associate with each other more than they do with their own country. They follow fashion trends halfway around the globe more than they follow what's for sale in the shop down the street. So that's what I want to talk about, how the internet is changing the way we think about the nation state and who we identify with. And my argument is, is we're moving away from being identified as citizens of a particular geography, a particular nation, and instead identifying with smaller localities, cities or provinces, or global organizations, global causes. And I think in the long run, this is a bigger and more important issue than the question of whether protesters are going to be using Twitter or Facebook and whether they'll succeed. Because this affects everyone in the long term. It affects the worldview of all citizens in all countries. And I go further to argue that this change in mindset is going to affect the policies of countries. Because as people start to identify across national boundaries, they're going to pressure their governments for changes in policy so that there's conceivably a chance for more harmonization across boundaries. So this is the evolution of diplomacy. 110 years ago, 
you had citizens, you had governments, and then you had diplomats. And diplomats were the gatekeepers. They were the one place where communication happened between countries. Well, that changed. In the Cold War, there was a need to reach a larger audience. And television and radio gave the US a way to broadcast directly into the Eastern Bloc and try to change the government of the, of the Soviet Union and, and satellite countries by changing the views of their people. But it was a one-way mode. It was simply broadcasting information into the Eastern Bloc. This has evolved so that by 10 years ago, we were using the internet and governments, particularly the US, were broadcasting information through the web to targeted groups in other countries. We were able to put things in specific languages, try to reach different interest groups. This has been effective. It's changed some people's view of what happens in the US and what we stand for. But I argue that what's really important is going to be citizen to citizen, peer to peer, Facebook diplomacy. Rather than a few conversations and a few streams of information, millions of different conversations are happening every day at this level, independent of, of governments. And these conversations have much more credibility than the conversations that involve government. This is relatively hidden. It takes a lot of work to find out what's really going on here. But it's increasing very fast, and it's having a huge impact. So as these connections get made, as people start communicating across national boundaries, as they join up with international groups of friends, there's going to be a shift. People will stop identifying as a member of Belgium, a citizen of Belgium. They instead see themselves as a European. The fact that Belgium doesn't have a government right now makes that easier. Um, but somebody in Tunisia might identify more as a Muslim. Someone in Switzerland may identify as a citizen of Zurich or Geneva, not as a member of the country of Switzerland. And you'll see identification with companies. I worked for IBM. There's 350,000 employees all around the world. And some of my fellow employees, particularly people from developing countries who had moved around, may have married somebody from another country, their association with IBM was almost as tight perhaps tighter than their connection to their native country. We even see people who are more fanatical about their so favorite soccer team, like Manchester United, than the country of their birth. So this leads to some questions. One question I, I worry about is that we're going to have a debate next year during the presidential election about whether the US is an exceptional nation. Newt Gingrich is already framing this issue. Sarah Palin is talking about this. I like the word exceptional. And I think that everyone in this room is exceptional. I, I think America has been an exceptional experiment. What worries me is we're talking about the exceptional nation, as if we're special and you're not. We want to keep what we've got, not share it with you. So I, I'm very worried that this is going to be a meme that's going to cause a lot of pain and a lot of problems for the US if it's pursued to its logical conclusion. And rather, I'd like to think about the United States as an exceptional network, a hub of a global network of people who work together for all sorts of different reasons, who every day get on Facebook and connect to people in five or six or 40 different countries, people united by some interest, love for a certain soccer team, a certain hobby, a certain company. If we can think of ourselves as an exceptional network, I think we will be ready to really win the future, as President Obama says. Maybe it matters more that we're part of a community of people who share common values, common goals. And maybe it matters more that we connect to people wherever they are. So what can we do to take advantage of this concept? What can we do to foster this idea of the exceptional network centered around the US? Well, the first is to change the mindset, to stop talking about the exceptional nation as if where you live or where you're born really defines whether you're part of this. I worry that by talking about the exceptional nation, we're going to be tending to be exclusive, frame things as us versus them. If we talk about the exceptional network, that welcomes all ideas to the table, 
welcomes people to be part of our different networks, our different communities. That is a much better metaphor than being focused on the walls around our country and our borders. Second thing we need to do is we need to understand these transnational social networks. Fortunately, some very exciting work is being done in this area. The Harvard Berkman Center has teamed up with Morningside Analytics to analyze thousands of bloggers and blogs all over the Middle East and to come to understand how people are talking to each other and what they're talking about. And they're finding that there are these bridge bloggers. One fascinating result of their work was that the people of India and Pakistan are talking to each other a lot more than they ever have in history. I had the chance to do graduate work in the Himalaya when I was uh, about 25 years ago. We stayed at a hotel run by a, a former Indian Army colonel. He was convinced that Pakistanis had tails. He didn't see any problem with human rights violations because they weren't human. And he never, ever had any reason to talk to a Pakistani unless he was capturing a prisoner. That can't happen today. According to facebook.com slash peace, yesterday 46,000 new friendships were made between Indians and Pakistanis. And that's happening every day. What the Berkman Project found was that cricket blogs were where Indians and Pakistanis were talking to each other. That was the network that was crossing the boundaries and helping these people realize that no matter which side of the border you're on, you have common interests and common concerns. Lots of other things we can do. Foster peer-to-peer -peer pen pals at elementary school. Start doing a lot more in foreign language education because for the first time, Americans really have a chance to practice their language every day. Leverage the immigrants. We're having a talk in the last session by Pablo Molina on how immigrants are using the net to relink to their, their heritage. And then we need to make sure the net's there so that this phenomenon can continue. So that leads to my final slide, which is why I'm an optimist, why I'm a cyber utopian. I think this Facebook diplomacy, peer-to-peer -peer diplomacy, can actually bring people together around common causes. People will then provide political pressure up to their government, pushing for policies that might lead to more cooperation, more win-win policies for the global economy, for peace, for prosperity. So that's my hope, that's my big idea, and I hope it happens sooner, not later. Thank you.